Oh. All right, here we go. You're all ready? Find a good seat. Really, really good seat. We're calling in some of the just most epically beautiful Saraswati energy for this practice today. I know uh, where I have some lack of clarity in my experience of the world that I'm bringing into being. And it's just a, it's an amazing place to be, to be uh, in the awareness, like, and that's Saraswati right there. You know, can you bring awareness to where you don't have clarity and to where you feel a little contracted and where you feel a little bit of ick in your life? Um, Cause we all have it and it shows up in its most unique ways. Um, 45 in the morning, waking up about, you know, stewing over this or that, or maybe you have a little upset with somebody else in your life and you hear the harsh words coming out of your mouth. Maybe when they're not even present, you're kind of, you know, <laughs> jabbing them behind their back um, or yourself, or, you know, there, there might be something when you open your checkbook and you're like, ah, oh my God. Um, you know, I don't know what it is for you where uh, maybe it's, you know it though, that I know. And so if Saraswati is here to help us find clarity, we have to allow for lack of. And in the lack of clarity, we can start to bring deeper inquiry. And here's a Saraswati practice as well. She is the goddess of wisdom and inquiry. She's the goddess of pattern and within pattern there comes like all of creation and speech and um just everything coming into being so if you think of that beautiful om that yogis learn to open to it's not something that's familiar for most people who come to the practice of yoga like it's not really the first reason you come to a yoga class like I want to get intimate with the sound of Aum <laughs> I want to know that and to let it feel familiar to me that's usually not why people come and then we learn along the way that encoded in that one syllable that sacred sound that yogis learn to open to over time is the whole cycle of all creation. And we have the ah, the oh, the mm, the silence. So it's got four parts and that can blow your mind. And then we can uh, receive deeper teachings if we can open to that one sacred syllable and just go, okay, there's a deeper meaning here. And then maybe we start to be able to embrace that there's these goddesses and these gods and that they have metaphor and profound teachings and in the tantric practice that they're not just some imaginary thing <laughs> that they're actually the living breathing uh, encoded embodiment of the energy of that which they share their wisdom and so Saraswati she's the shakti she's the energy that flows through life she who flows she's the essence and the current she's the the known and the ever-changing and when we think about uh energy and movement so we've worked with spanda we um, if you were here for two or three series ago we brought in Ganesha and Ganesha is where we first started to pull in this idea that there's a contraction and an expansion and we called it Spanda and when we open to that um, energy flow that pulsation now we have the ohm and it starts to undulate and so I'm just going to invite you to let your body kind of move around a little bit and find how energy flows through you and we, as yogis, learn to not block the flow and to embrace where we feel blocked. <laughs> so that's the paradox of, of Saraswati right there. <sighs> we'll talk as we go through this practice today, a few more of the uh, different patterns of movement. So we've got spanda, this pulsation, and we can honor that there's a contraction, 
where we might feel occluded from our own knowing. And then there's moments where we have revelation. And so it, that right there is the spanda, not just of, of uh, physical movement, but of energetic and perhaps emotional and thought movement. Reach for your two blankets or one blanket. Flatten those out so that you've got a folded edge that's firm. And you'll place that folded edge. Oh, so the top of your mat, where would your head go? And where would your shoulder blades go? So you want the folded edge to go where your shoulder blades would go, leaving enough room at the top of your mat for your head. And I'm stacking two blankets. You may only have one and that's fine. All right, so the top of the upper arm bone is what I meant to say, that that's the part of you. So it goes level with the base of your neck and, and in all things right and good world. And we want that to be level with that folded edge of your blanket so that when you lay yourself down, you've got the top of your arm bone right at the top of that fold and your neck is not on your blanket. And just give yourself a, a clarity check. Reach up with your hands and really make sure that the round part of your upper shoulders, the head of the humerus bone is flush with that fold of your blanket and, that, and then reach back and make sure your neck is not on the blanket. And then we'll take active feet like bridge pose, arms like bridge pose. Soften the eyes, the gaze. From right behind your eyes, press back to where your head touches your, your mat. And find that um, in this shape, the pubic bone is likely much lower than the top of your sacrum. So you'll need a little more tailbone action as you push through your feet. Pressing through the feet, the back of your head, your triceps on your blanket. Take some breath. And from here, you could choose to um, keep your hips on the floor and lift one foot or both feet up into a modified shoulder stand. That could be, you could switch one leg for the other, or you could lift both feet up and figure out what that feels like in your body. And uh, we're going to try to get your hips up over and up. And then as you hold your hips, can you draw your shoulder blades towards your spine? Go ahead and bend your knees so they're not all the way upright. Look towards your eyebrows and trust that you can hear my instructions. If you need to come out of the pose entirely to see what's going on. In other words, <clears throat> try not to turn your head in this shape. It's not good for your neck. And uh, if you've got high blood pressure, this could be your stopping point uh, where the knees stay bent. Yeah, high blood pressure that's not controlled. Yeah, or you may need to bring your feet down to the floor altogether. And if you're fine, you feel clear, and you're you know you're healthy in that way, you can then uh, push through the back of the head and lift the legs upright, maybe one at a time. And if you'd like to take this, you can uh, start to cycle the legs and. See about extending from the power of your center. Legs in two directions. Now, is your breath helping you do this? wherever this is, whatever this is.
And then we'll slowly press through your head as you roll down. And then open your arms and your heart. Take some windshield wiper twists with your legs. Ah, nice, big, long exhalation. And you place one hand to your heart, one hand to your belly. Now let's take that sweet sound of om. And I'm invite you to make the different sounds of om, the ah, the o, oh, the m, mm, and the silence. And just give yourself permission to see which phase of the ohm, which part of the cycle um, is a little less clear for you. And just uh, which one feels like it's calling you to drop in with greater awareness. Ah, oh, mm, or that silence where the breath fills you back in. So take your time. Um. Um. Here's a great way to practice asking for intuitive guidance. So your mind or your, notice where you're going to receive information when you're asked this very simple question. Do you want to remain on your back for Shavasana or would you like to come upright into a seated meditation posture? Wait. Put the two possibilities into the stillness. And see which one emerges. And um, my first answer just gained greater clarity and it changed. So whatever your uh, awareness is, so um, either create a very mindful Shavasana or take your time to rise up. The light in me bows to the light in you. Namaste. Thank you. <laughs>